where you're joining from. We're really excited to have you here. Thanks for joining. Um, we are going to be having a TBPPM webinar on the effects of COVID on TV services in the private sector. It's called the COVID study. It was conducted in India, Nigeria, and Indonesia. And today we're going to be deep diving into the findings for Nigeria. Um, it's a one hour session and we will be, um, this will involve two presentations, one from the study um, authors and another from the national TV program. And then we'll have a moderated panel session after which we'll open up for questions. So we're really excited to have you, to hear your insights, your thoughts, whatever questions it is that you have to ask, please make sure you do so. Um, as, the, as, the, as the presentations go on, as the webinar goes on, please feel free to start by using the Q&A section to start to put your questions down even before we get to the actual question and answer sessions at the end so that it can be moderated and so that we can make sure that we do our best to give you the best responses. Um, so other housekeeping things to note is that it's going to be live streamed. Um, so it's been recorded, as I'm sure you all heard at the beginning, and it's going to be live streamed on YouTube. Um, then in addition to that, we will also be sharing the final presentations um, on our website after the project. So after the, the, the webinar, so you can look out for that if, if it's something that's of interest to you. Um, also, we encourage you, if you haven't already joined the TBPPM Learning Network, to do so. There are lots of resources, announcements, information, webinars of this sort that happen um, time and again so that you don't miss out on all the great information that we have to share. So that's pretty much it. Welcome, everyone. Um, so I'll be passing over to my colleague, um, Charity Olga Menka, who will introduce the panelists and take it from there. So Charity, over to you. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Aji. Good morning, everyone. Um, um, so thank you for joining our webinar today. So today we'll, you know, be sharing results from our COVID study. As Aji said, the study was implemented in three countries, Nigeria, Indonesia, and India, with support from researchers from McGill University, Georgetown University, and the University of Waterloo. And so in Nigeria, the, the study was implemented in collaboration with the Sustaining Health Outcomes through the private sector, the Shops Plus TB program, and also with support from the national program. We are very pleased today to have with us Dr. Chukuma Anaike, the Director and National Coordinator of the National Tuberculosis, Leprosy, and Buruli Ulcer Control Program at the Federal Ministry of Health. And he has extensive experience in infectious diseases. We also have Dr. Bolanle Udushola Falaye, a public health physician with extensive health system strengthening, TB, HIV programming, and private sector engagement experience, who has also worked as a technical director for the USAID funded sustaining health outcomes through the private sector, that's the Shops uh, Plus program. And then we also have from the national program, Dr. Ubioma, she's also around and she would uh, be sharing some thoughts during the uh, panel discussions. And our moderator today is Lauren. Lauren was with the Shops Plus program during the research, um, uh, actual research, but right now she's the Associate Director for Evaluation and Adaptive Learning at Results for Development. Lauren has extensive experience as a researcher and evaluator of U US government and donor funded health, economic growth and social service programs. And she was a co-investigator, like I mentioned, for this uh, study. We hope that the uh, webinar will provide you with valuable insights into the impact of COVID-19 on private sector healthcare in Nigeria and the strategies that have been adopted to mitigate this impact. So with that, I'll hand you over to our moderator, Lauren, over to you. Uh, thank you, Charity. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody on the call. Thank you for joining. Um, I'd like to hand it over to Bola, who's going to walk us through some of the uh, really interesting study results um, from the Nigeria arm of the COVID study. Bola, over to you. Thank you so much, Lauren, and um, hello, everyone. It's good to be here again sharing the findings from the COVID study that was conducted in Nigeria in 2021. Um, like Charity has said, um, it's based on the COVID study that covered three major countries, including Nigeria in 2021. 
Before I proceed, can you all confirm that you can see my screen, please? Yes, we can. All right, thank you. The aim of that project was to evaluate the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the private health sector in India, Indonesia, and Nigeria. And three major studies were compounded in this one study. We had the patient pathway analysis that sought to understand how patients moved from the time they sought care for their symptoms to the point where they were recruited in the private health facilities that were part of the study. We also have the standardized patient survey. It's like a mystery client survey, which was actually a follow on to the mystery client phase one survey that was conducted by the short course program in 2019 before COVID. So this study actually afforded us the opportunity to compare what patients experienced in the facilities and what providers did before COVID and after COVID. We also have the provider and facility survey that actually now went to details to look at the services being provided and how quality of care was affected um, by COVID. It was a mixed methods approach where we had a quantitative survey covering both the patients and the providers. We have a qualitative aspect of the study that delved more into the patient's experiences by interviewing them. They chose um, a selected number of them. We also interviewed our policy makers, including you know, the national coordinator for the national program and the team, and also the national program data formed part of the data that went into this um, result that we are sharing today. There were collaborations in country. Magdal did a good job of identifying major partners in each of the three countries that will that's added the research. More on Nigeria, TB, and COVID-19 epidemiology. We do know that Nigeria is the sixth um, highest um, TB burden country in the world, and we are the highest in Africa. The um, incidence rate for TB in Nigeria is 219 per 100,000. And um, interestingly, the private sector accounts for 67% of initial TB care seeking. This has been shown across various studies um, even before now. However, as of 2019, the private sector accounted for only 19%, 16% of the new TB cases as of 2019. For the COVID-19 um, pandemic, we had just over 260,000 COVID cases that were reported and just about 3,000 deaths. So the, the case fatality rate was really low in Nigeria compared to other countries. The intensive lockdown period was between March and May 2020. Lockdown started on May March 30th and ended in the first week of May. The interesting thing about Nigeria is that while the most part of the world reported a drop in TB notifications in 2020, um, the year of the pandemic, compared to um, before, Nigeria actually reported an increase of 15% in case notification. And this study, the findings we're sharing today are part of the Nigerian Sussex story. It tells us the story and gives us the evidence behind the data that the National TV Program has shared with the rest of the world. It gives more credibility to that data that the country has so proudly shown um, to the rest of the world and which the world is actually learning from. We actually did suffer a setback, however, as a country in terms of the DRTB notifications that dropped by 14% and the treatment coverage for DRTB patients that dropped by 20% as a result of the pandemic. As we had earlier introduced um, when Petra started and Charity as well, Shops Plus was a major partner that implemented the COVID study in Nigeria. It's um, a project that was implemented by APT Associates and was funded by USAID. Before the pandemic, way back in 2018, as part of Nigeria's PPM strategy, um, Shops Plus had um, supported the national TV program to form networks of private providers in Lagos and Kano. These two states and cities are the, are very important in Nigeria because they're the two most popular states. Um, they have some of the highest TB body and they have the highest number of private providers. So it's a perfect setting to look at what private providers can do and can bring in both before COVID and also during COVID. Lagos, coincidentally, was also the one the worst hit state in terms of COVID pandemic um, in Nigeria. The data for the survey was con collected between May and July 2021. Now let's look at the study results itself. Remember, we said there are three major studies in one, and the first is the provider and facility survey. It was a mixed method study where we used both quantitative, qualitative, and also uh, the national program data. For the quantitative survey, we looked at over 2,400 private facilities. Most of them were in Lagos, about 1,400 of them, and just over 1,000 were in Kano. 
for a set of clinical facilities was an additional model that delved more into the COVID pandemic and the experiences of these private providers that we have engaged to provide TBKs, you know, TBK with COVID-19. And that was an additional model just for hospitals. But the rest of the providers, PPMVs, community pharmacies and the labs all had the same general, um, you know, um, part of the first part of the survey. And then we have um, the analysis of the qualitative survey using thematic content analysis. This slide shows the breakdown of the providers. We have the majority, just over 55% of providers in Lagos, and most of them are shops plus facilities, about 69% of them. The rest were unengaged facilities, and that's what makes this study even more interesting. We're not looking at only providers that were engaged by the National TV Program through shops plus. We're also looking at providers that were not engaged and their experiences as well. And this provides Nigeria with you know, valuable information about the private sector and their potential for providing TB cases in Nigeria. In terms of the types of the facilities or the private facilities, we have almost half of them being the patent medicine vendors that we call PPMVs in Nigeria. We have about one quarter of them being hospitals, about 14% were community pharmacists and the rest were labs. Majorities of these providers, about 89% of them were accredited by either um, the health facility registration agencies in each of the states or the Ministry of Health itself. Now, this is the first actual result we are looking at that shows the extent of the closure. How did the lockdown and COVID in itself affect the facilities in terms of their closing hours and their opening time? We saw that about 70% of the providers actually remained open all through the lockdown period. This is very significant. But we saw that when the rest of the country was affected and um, locked down, these private providers continued working. For many of them, it's a matter of either they adapt or they perish. They had to remain relevant. They, remember, they don't have salaries. They generate from their income from whatever they do as private providers. So most of them remained open even during the lockdown because, of course, the government allowed um, essential care workers to um, keep working. And many of them tapped to this opportunity. However, about 30% closed down during this period. Not many of them offered COVID-19 screening and some of the reasons we knew from the programmatic angle that they just don't want to get entangled in the old COVID thing. And many of them have been shut down, you know, because they were exposed. They were had to report that they had a COVID-19 case in their facility and they were regarded as being contaminated and shut down. So we understood those that even stopped TB screening even at that time because of these challenges. This graph shows, um, you know, the um, types of provider and the length of time and the number of times they were closed down for. The bars at the bottom of the slide shows how many of the, of the facilities were shut down looking at the month. You will see that most of them were shut down majorly at the peak of the lockdown between April and May. And of course, at the lockdown eased after May, you will see many of them um, opening um, thereafter. This compares TB notification and COVID-19 um, picking in, each, um, in the country for each of the states. So the top blue bars represent Kano, while the bottom gray bars represent Lagos. And you will see, interestingly, that at the peak of the pandemic, look at the, around the middle of this graph, you will see where you have the trough, where um, there was um, a lot of, um, the lockdown was most intense in April 2020. And you see that the TV case notifications were the lowest for both states. And then you will see a gradual you know, increase or rebound after the lockdown, May and June. Kano beat all odds, actually, rebounded more than any, um, more than Lagos states, especially, because they hit about 415 cases in July, 403 in August, and 504 in um, September. These were shops plus engaged private facilities. And in the history of the shops plus program, that was the highest number of TB cases in the private sector that Kano ever reported just after of the pandemic lockdown was easing out. There was still COVID-19, obviously. There were still a lot of restrictions, but Kano managed to rebound and they hit over 504. As you would see in the national program presentation later on, Kano actually had the majority of their providers being patent medicine vendors. And these providers went to the community, found presumptives, collected samples from them and ensured they were tested. And that is the success story behind Kano's result. You can learn more about our provider um, and facility survey from a recent publication um, that um, this group 
had um, published. Let's look at the um, second type of study, the patient pathway analysis. These patients were recruited from among these facilities. The facilities were also recruited in a very systematic way. There were a total of 180 patients surveyed across 18 facilities in Lagos and Kano, nine facilities in Lagos, nine in Kano, three facilities per senatorial district. You know, like we have three senatorial districts in each state in Nigeria. So we have three facilities from each senatorial district in each of Kano and Lagos. And we made sure um, only one facility per LGA in that senatorial district. We avoided having two facilities in the same um, LGAs within each senatorial district so that we could have an even distribution of the facilities. We used a non probability quota sampling in eight high volume facilities, meaning that we looked at the patient characteristics, wanted to have a good representation of patients who turned out to be TB patients and those who tested negative eventually. We also wanted a balance between male and female patients. We avoided HIV positive patients because of the obvious um, complications that will arise in terms of care seeking. So we went for those who were HIV negative. So being HIV positive was a um, was an um, a, a non eligibility criteria. We used that to screen um, patients out. We looked at their social demographic characteristics, looked at their health seeking behavior, and looked at their pathway to care during the COVID nineteen pandemic. And we even asked them questions before the pandemic to compare their experiences both before and during the pandemic. We also went in depth with 20 patients selected based on convenience. So among these 180 patients, we found 20 that had the time in the immediate um, you know, period to offer in-depth um, interview on their experience. So we could have the qualitative experience behind the data that we were seeing. This table illustrates the kind of data that we got, social demographic data uh, in the top part of the table, and the bottom part you will see things about their nearest public health facility, which was a major determinant in most studies um, in healthcare seeking. And now the interesting findings. From what we found, we saw that there are lots of delays, maybe not as bad as we typically thought, you know, Africans um, or Nigerians would have in terms of healthcare seeking because only 53.4% of the patients sought care within a week of noticing their symptoms, 17.8% said they sought care within two days, and 11% sadly waited over two months before seeking care. And the quotations from the patient, direct quotations on the slide tells us why. The first quotation tells us the typical story, even without COVID. When, when patients notice symptoms, they first try herbs or traditional medicine, then they go to a chemist before eventually seeking care. This patient said he waited 10 days for the drugs he got from the PPMVs to make him feel better, you know, but then they didn't. And that, again, tells us the pivotal role that PPMVs play in terms of um, providing TB care in Nigeria. A patient said the fear of COVID made them stay at home. This was an experience we saw in some other cook and dirty studies that we did, um, you know, with among US partners at that time, that most patients just were afraid of seeking care. And the ones that sought care were the very, very bad, you know, um, or very, very sick patient. However, this slide, these graphs on the right show us that the TB patients were the ones that experienced the most delays. So we are looking at three types of delay. We have the patient delay, which is the healthcare seeking delay. We have the diagnostic delay, which is usually a provider delay, and of course the treatment delay. You see that the um the bus to the the um bus to the right, the second ones are the TB patients on the first set of graphs, and they were the most that were um, most um, affected in terms of delay for in healthcare seeking and in um, also getting tested. And these are serious implications for infection control and for um, you know, the cure of the patients themselves. At the bottom half you are going to, of the graph, you will see comparing Lagos and Kano. So the Lagos providers were more agile in terms of testing. So you see less delay in the middle um, you know, double bars. You see that Lagos has less in terms of provider delay for diagnosis, but then, the patients in Lagos apparently sought care later comparatively than the ones in Kano. So more patient delay in Lagos, but less provider delay in terms of both diagnosis and treatment. And this is the patient pathway graph that tells us that, so you have Kano um, and Lagos in the first, but these are the first um, the recruitment sites where the patients went to. So about 89 patients out of the 180 actually said the patients, um, the providers where they were recruited from, the private hospitals where they were recruited from, were their first facilities. 
This speaks a lot about the role that the private hospitals have come to play in terms of TB case detection and treatment in Nigeria. Then we have other you know, providers coming in. We have patients that actually went to PPMVs first um, before they came to the facilities. You will see that those are the second set of bars there. And then you will see about 35% of them said they went to PPMVs and CP first. And 36% said they went to another private hospital first, which might have been the one that referred them to the eventual place where they were diagnosed or maybe they were just, um, you know, they just found their way eventually to the recruitment site. We also have 2% going to a private lab. However, one other interesting finding on this slide is the site of the diagnosis. We would say that our private hospitals provided the diagnosis for TB in 75% of the patients sampled. And a good number also went to PPMVs and CPs who may not have the capacity to diagnose, but they can collect samples and they have been collecting samples. We also have an appreciable um, percentage, 100% of them actually started treatment in the private facility. And that's also significant in terms of the patient pathway. And this is encouraging for the private sector um, in Nigeria. Um, this talks about the number of the average number of providers that the patient had encounters with before they eventually got to the site of recruitment. Remember, this was where you know them were diagnosed and they were they started treatment. So an average um, patient saw two providers in Kano, while um, the most patients in Lagos saw a bit less, 1.69. Somehow telling us that okay, maybe there is more access to care. But then looking at the table and the um, and the, um, the 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 mean number of encounters, you would say that most people um, that went to private facilities and the, that was where they actually um, got um, you know diagnosed, and that's where they actually were recruited from in the study. The third type of study that we did was a standardized patient um, survey, and this is like mystery client survey. And this was a follow-on to the mystery client, um, mystery client survey phase one that short closed in 2019. So we had a lot of data to compare with. Again, it was a cross-sectional um, survey conducted in short closed facilities, but this time we focused on hospitals and PPNVs only. In phase one, we focused on all types of providers, hospitals, labs, PPNVs, and CPs, but we saw the most potential for change in the hospitals and PPMVs. So we focused on them in phase two with the, in, in collaboration with the COVID survey. We had over 500 um, visits by the mystery clients. And um, we had um, you know, case studies. The first was a textbook case of presumptive TB, who will present to a facility and say that you know, they have about two or three weeks of cough and fever and weight loss. We expect the patient to do three major things in order for them to align the national TB program guidelines. What is a provider supposed to do if a patient show up with these classical symptoms? Remember, these are mystery clients and not real patients. They were sent to those facilities to elicit um, the kind of care and the quality of care that the providers would provide. So the first one we expect the providers to do is to confirm the TB symptoms, ask more questions, what we call TB screening. Apart from the couple cells that they have, if our guidelines say the patient that has even one of these four symptoms, this core TB signal should be you know, investigated. But we even said, let's see how well they can screen a patient present with cough. We also looked at the second um, you know, correct management, which is an attempt or a recommendation or even a referral of the patient for appropriate diagnostic test, which could be gene expert, which is our first line of diagnosis in Nigeria, or even AV microscopy, if there are major bottlenecks to having gene expert done, or even checks history. Or a referral. Any of these we were lenient enough to say anyone that even thought of TB enough to ask for any of these tests or even refer the patient for any of these tests would be adjudged to have correctly managed the patient. And the third major thing, picking again, picking from the NTBLCP guideline, is that the provider that suspects TB should refrain until after diagnosis, should refrain from giving anti TB medicines and definitely should not give. We also exhaust and can and you will see that the waiting time in the facilities varied. We looked at the waiting, waiting time and we compared it across the different states. And we also compared um, the kind of um, physician or provider that they saw. Some saw doctors, some saw pharmacists, 
or PPNV depending on if they went to a PPNV store and others um they couldn't our mystery client couldn't tell what kind of provider they were and of course some son nurses and of course we also look at the gender of the most high rank high ranking um you know provider that they saw we wanted to know if this affected the kind of of care that they got eventually and we compared across shops plus facilities the non-network facilities and the drug shop that is the PPNVs wanted to know um, who would have a better quality of care? Where do we have gaps and challenges? So this slide tells us more about who did what among these different types of providers. So the blue bars, the dark blue bars represent the shops plus, um, you know, drug shops. The lighter blue bars represent the shops plus hospitals. And then the gray bars represent the non-engaged or what we call non-network clinical facilities. They were hospitals, but they were not engaged by the TB program. You will see that most PPMVs actually did better than other providers in terms of asking about the duration of cough. This is not surprising because we trained PPMVs to look for cough as a major symptom. That was the only, that's the only symptom we make them focus on because of their level of, of experience and skill. However, you will see that the providers did better in terms of taking the next step and testing. And the shop stores providers did much better, 50% of, of cases in attempting to take um, a diagnostic test. And 87% of the shop store providers also did not prescribe antibiotics or steroids, while the BPMVs, not surprisingly, did worse in that um, regard. In terms of all three steps and looking at correct management practices across all the three groups of providers that we studied, the short course providers, the clinical facilities, the hospitals did best in scoring 40% correct management um, compared to the others who scored um, much lower. And this again shows us um, the breakdown of each of the um, criteria that we looked at. And it's very important to study this um, slide very carefully. So we have screening on the, on the second row, on the second column, we have testing, and then we have inappropriate testing, um, inappropriate um, dispensing of medications. We compared a number of variables. So we compared 2019 and 2021. And you will see that in terms of screening, 2021 seemed better, but you will see that the adjusted odds ratio reached 1.12 when in actual fact, it was not statistically significant. So we cannot say with all confidence that cleaning improved in 2019 compared to 2021. And COVID was a major factor in this. Like we explained earlier, private facilities were very apprehensive of being tagged um, as um, contaminated because they reported a COVID case. So they would rather not even ask. And this uh, unintentionally affected TB case finding as well. We didn't do as much as we could have done if everybody went all out to screen. For testing, you will see that there's a major significant improvement in terms of um, the result we got in 2019, the mystery client survey, and in 2021, you will see that um, the, the p value there is 0 0.03, which is very, which is significant. In terms of avoiding inappropriate antibiotics, we also did much better. In fact, way, way, way much better. Maybe COVID helped in this regard because people were now like, let's just be sure of what we are dealing with. And of course, with all the trainings they got about TB as well, we cannot underestimate the effects of that. In terms of Lagos and Kano, Lagos providers seem to do better in terms of not prescribing antibiotics. Okay, because you would see that third column where the people is, you know, 0 0.001, whereas in the other places, it's just between zero, around 0 0.0, so we cannot say it is significant, but in terms of not, you know, prescribing antibiotics, Lagos providers did better than Kano providers. Comparing shops plus and um, non-network facilities and even the PPMVs, the clinical facilities did way better for screening and even for testing. We'll see the p-value there um, reading 0 0.008 and less than 0 0.001. In terms of the gender of the providers, we looked at to see if the male providers did better in terms of screening, but not as well, you know, in terms of testing and avoiding inappropriate antibiotics. Um, and looking at the overall results, again, you see that Lagos providers did better overall than Kano providers. But remember, Kano brought in actually a lot more TB cases in terms of the first, um, you know, um, survey, um, looking at providers and the facilities and the cases that came in through them. And of course, looking at short course and non short course facilities, short course facilities did better than the PPMVs and the unengaged facilities. In conclusion, 
we would like to say that our findings highlight the resilience in the private sector as providers because we covered very quickly from the pandemic disruption and it's under it on it actually um underscores their importance the importance of their role in supporting TB control in Nigeria. We also found out that caretaking pathways among our participants involved about one to four providers. Most patients had seen about two providers before they got to the site where they were recruited in a private facility. And 39% of the participants of the patients actually um, you know, received diagnostic tests at the first provider um, visits. And this is actually encouraging. This is above one third that our patients can actually get TB testing from the first provider they visit in over one third of the cases is actually very commendable. We also saw that the quality of care before COVID did not vary so much um, you know, compared to after COVID. In actual fact, we did better in terms of testing and in terms of not giving inappropriate medications like antibiotics and anti-TB drug without testing. And overall, we can say that um, TB services in the private sector in Nigeria was not significantly adversely affected by COVID-19. Our data proves this. Our data um, has been shown um, you know, to actually demonstrate this. And this study only gave evidence and more credibility to our data. And this aligns um, with Nigeria's increase in TB notification and increasing TPM contribution during COVID and even after COVID, as the NTP presentation will show, I'm sure, in spite of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank you so much, Bola, for walking us through the really complex study with a lot of different pieces. Um, it is really interesting to see the data that kind of confirms what we already knew from what we were seeing with, with notification rates. Um, so I'm going to hand the, the mic over to our a uh, participant from the National TB program, Dr. Anyaki, to uh, provide some reflections, a little bit about what their experience was during COVID and how that does or does not align with, with some of the things that we observed in the study. So Dr. Anyaki, whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, everyone from Nigeria. I hope you can hear me. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so um, I've just been given 10 minutes to speak, and I will just go straight to the salient points. Um, I'm going to speak on the reflections and the national. PPM progress and plan for the national program in Nigeria. And so by way of background information, we, we all don't just know, but let me just recount that Nigeria still ranks the first in Africa in terms of the disboarding and up to six globally. Um, as Dr. Bola has stated, we have you know, an annual incidence of 219 per 100,000 population. And which shows that uh, we, we have an incidence of above 400,000 annually. Um, just by the end of 2022, we came up with treatment average coverage of 60%. And then we still having a, you know, a staggering 40% missing cases in the country. We have not done so badly in terms of you know, the status, finding the status of TB amongst the, patient, the HIV patients and also uh, you know, the, the proportion of them that are on treatment. Um, on our diagnostic platform, we, we have um, above, uh, about 507 gene expert machines that are distributed all over the country, and 90 of them is from the private facilities. In terms of uh, uh, treatment, um, treatment and healthcare provision, we, we have not less than um, 21 healthcare facilities in the country, and then 25% uh, of them coming from the private uh, health facilities. 
So um, the first case of uh, COVID-19 came up in Nigeria on 27th February 2020. And of course, I won't bore you with all those. We have, you know, uh, up to four waves of COVID-19, but they all came with, you know, the same scenarios of, you know, um, total apprehension, you know, and by the, you know, the population, the healthcare workers, and then with the attendance stigma and people not, you know, wanting to go back to the hospitals and even the healthcare providers also being apprehensive because they do not want to get the, um, the COVID-19. But in all, you know, we had gap in monitoring quality of basic management units. And um, at the laboratory side, were, there was this phobia, and even though most of them, most of the laboratory people and even healthcare workers contracted uh, COVID-19. And then unfortunately, you know, um, we lost most of the healthcare providers. You know, presenting experience access challenge, just like I said, most of them, you know, we are, we, because of the lockdown, they were not able to go to the hospital to seek for care. And that, you know, triggered, you know, the, the trajectory of, you know, moving towards the, the, you know, finding a way out, you know, of uh, filling the gap in, that, in terms of healthcare uh, provision in the country. So we, we set up the weekly monitoring, uh, you know, testing program. As COVID cases increase, we also noticed that the expert testing decreased and it also impacted relatively to, you know, our performance in, in the country. So when you look at the graph, you will see that, you know, the, the lockdown started in March and you will see that there's, you know, a downward trend, you know, of, uh, you know, our case the, 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 the definition uh, identification in the country. So um, as a national program, we came up with a rapid response. We, we came up, had our usual technical meeting and sat down and reviewed our strategies and came up. Look, we, we must be able to change certain things. And then we, we came up with the distribution of five months drugs to sub-natural stores to make sure we do not have, you know, lack, you know, uh, drugs and uh, other community, uh, commodities in the States. And then for the patients, we, we increased, you know, um, their take home of medicines to at least one month, you know, anti-medicines to make sure that they do not run out of the stock of medicines. Of course, our case finding and case management activities we are taking to the communities. And this is very important, even as we are talking about, you know, primary health care, we have found that in every disease intervention, we must, you know, proactively engage the communities because that is where the epicenter and it, you know, also confirms, you know, the health system, which is being driven globally as, you know, being uh, the primary health care, being, you know, the, the, the unit for if we not, if we need to, you know, run towards you know, achieving the, the SDG of 2030. So our case TB was integrated with care. We, case TB finding was also integrated with COVID-19 because that we saw it as you know a, another plus which we can use to make sure that we do not lose track of what we are doing. And we, I want to use the opportunity to thank the WHO MPOs because they actively you know, you know, helped us in, in this process. Of course, we had to change our you know, guidelines, our LSOP to run in accordance with the situation we found ourselves in the country. The, the second point I want to make here is that, you know, this is uh, active integration of services in, in play. You know, in, in our coming up with the good result of integrating two, pro, two, two programs that, that, you know, at the same time, I'm coming up with good uh, results. So this is just, you know, um, I'm sorry, I have to show you, but this is just, one of the policy documents that we revised to come up with ways of, you know, in changing our strategy towards, you know, increasing the uh, case notification in the country. Of course, we did not run away from the usual, you know, what we've been preaching about prevention, making sure that you cover your nose, the etiquette of coughing, and making sure that we keep the distance. In fact, you know, before when people see uh, individuals with face masks, people tend to run away from them. But COVID nineteen became, you know, a common a common scenario. People were 
you know, work just in improve on their and their, their their methods of preventing themselves and covering their, their faces and nose, and even the cough etiquette. So this is just the the house to house uh, um, guidelines that we come up with, but we saw that you know not just you know um, going to the communities because of the lockdown, people the the community care workers had to move from house to house and making sure that they engage every relevant person to help in that process. So the program stepped up more actions in DB notification. We implemented bad directional screening diagnosis intervention with WHO, as I mentioned. We developed you know, TB SBC materials that address stigma during COVID-19 to enable persons to persist, you know, persist with persistent cough to seek for care because we know that even around that time, there was this, you know, um, apprehension. People do not want to be ascribed to have gotten uh, uh, COVID-19 because they'll be kept in the hospital. So it was a lot of confusion there, but, you know, but we came up with this strategy of making sure that we carry every person and even in the in means of, you know, um, um, because there was so much funding, there was so much in, uh, in attention towards COVID-19. And I saw that the only way we can as a national since they come with the same symptoms, so we now have to integrate, you know, uh, move, move into the communities and leveraging the available resources uh, to make sure we, we get to addressing our own case. So we noticed a rapid expansion of TV services by 44% to the private health facilities. And it's also important for us to know that, you know, it has been in a distance because most of, almost 60% of Nigerians seek for um, uh, medical care at, you know, at the primary and at the private uh, health uh, facilities in the country. But this was an eye opener. It's a shift that we, we had no other option but to even activate was to make sure that we save the lives of Nigerians. So this just shows you know the deep, like I said in the in the earlier on, you will see that there's a very big deep at the second quarter of um our of that 2020 because we noticed that there was a very big deep. But when we readjusted, you see that the the the, the case notification you know started increasing you know gradually to uh, you know to, uh, you know an appreciable 18 percent. Though there was an 18 percent decrease in the number, but from the top quarter to the fourth quarter, you notice that uh, the program has started picking up with uh, um, case notification in the country. So this just shows also um, that the COVID uh, um, effect shows a 2% drop in cases that are notified in quarter two in the country. But we bounce back from the quarter three. It's just a reflection of what, uh, what I just said in the, um, in the uh, previous slide. But it's very important for us to look at what happened at the state. On the first, from the last presentation, he, 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 because all the us worked, Luckily for them, they worked in Lagos and Kano, which are also the, the states with highest uh, population in the country. And um, Lagos State, you know, was uh, one of the epicenters, and FCT, that is the federal capital, was also an epicenter. But if you look, you will see that there's a relative downward trend of um, the case notification in the country, even though we met that uh, in increase in case notification generally in the country. But you notice that uh, COVID 19 also affected. What we are supposed to get that year. So the annual country case notification, you know, from the PPM, you know, increased by 108 percent compared to 200 and, uh, in the year 2019. And we found that you know we wouldn't have been able to do that without you know shifting towards you know PMVs, uh, community pharmacies, TPAs, and these are the structures that we must not neglect at the communities. So one thing we must take out from you know the, the, the COVID-19 is that it has pushed us back to recognizing the principles of primary health care, recognizing that the communities must not be best to have if we have to tame you know, any disease condition globally. So this also shows, you know, from I've told just before that this is what happened from the first quarter of 2020, uh, 2020, which has deep down and later on picked up. So what are the lessons we learned in this country? We have found out that to institute a resilient and sustainable system that can drive itself through emerging issues is very important. We have also seen that private sector engagement 
is very paramount if we need to tame any disease, whether infectious disease or even non-infectious disease, any health interventions, we must not look the other way around, you know, from the private sector. The third one, which I want to emphasize that is not here, is to making sure that we engage actively the community. The community is very important if we need to achieve whatever we want to get globally, even towards running towards uh, the global push for 20 that of leaving no one behind. So what is our progress in the national program? We have, funded, we have instituted a comprehensive PPM strategy using a customized approach, which provides different models of engagement for each private sector. We realize that they are not at the same pedestrian. So whatever that works, there's no one size fits all. Whatever that works for you know, each, each cadre of the private sector, private healthcare resources we run to. So we, we know that most of them are not at the same level. The national program is with a BBM, you know, specimen treatment, which follows the national referral pathway. Our data, you know, has also been, you know, we worked on to make sure that it runs through the, the national trend of data flow in the country. Recently, we just developed the costed BPM national uh, action plan 2022 to 2025. Like I said, the scheme by the right just shows that, you know, you know, with the hub and scope model, which we are come with, where the PPM, the community pharmacy, the TBAs, you know, get the, 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 the referral and they refer it to the private, uh, you know, the health facility that is within that geopolitical zone or that, you know, vicinity to make sure that we do not lose track. And then there's a track of making sure that the national the data also fits into the national uh, data uh, capturing uh, system, the country. So in the long run, we, we realize like, that- At least if I find that possible, as you have a validator in the state, that we look at it together. There was a time I, had, I thought that I'm having- that means that Someone was, is interrupting me. Okay, we look at it. We do uh, test it here. Hello? 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 Please continue, Dr. Anyaki. We have muted the person. Please continue. Okay, so, 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 so presently, you know, we have awoken the, the support of the private health facilities to the extent that we have increased, you know, by 40% in the country. And we have a mobile app that we have used to ease screening and reporting of the, from the PPL facilities. Of course, the, the right uh, graph is showing that it has not, it has been an increment and we want to scale up from where we are, where we are at the moment in terms of engaging the private uh, health facilities in the country. What's our plan? Our plan is to make sure that we sustain the, and, you know, the introduce linkage system, the linkage coordinators between the private sector and national program basic management unit ensure all identified cases in the private sector are captured and notified by the country. We also want to ensure that sustainability of incentives, fees, and other services to you know, and other enablers to make sure that you know, we, do not, we do not lose track. One thing we should also know that is notice is that you know, incentives you know, do a lot. So try, try to, you know, you know, to sustain the program. And also because of the, 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 the hardship in the communities, a little token, which may not be money, can even motivate you know, us to get into what we are looking for in terms of this intervention. We want to ensure a complete ownership of the DBPPM structure at the grassroots. And the only way we can do it is, to active, is by activating the community structures, activating the gatekeepers, making sure that people are accountable to their health. So it must, it must not be money, but just by mere recognizing what someone has done in the community will go a long way towards, you know, they're owning the program and, and then for to run with it as a country. We want to expand the strategic PPM intervention to cover all the states in the country, because at the moment we have a gap of 11 states that are still not covered. Of course, we need to improve our domestic resources in the country. In fact, in trying to engage actively the private sector, not this time around, not the private health sector, the private sector, every person, the philanthropies, 
every many way, many Nigerians to make sure that uh, um, they put in their, their support towards, you know, um, taking care of TB patients in the country. I want to thank you for the opportunity and I want to thank you for the audience and patience. Thank you. I will stand beside for any um, clarifications or questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nyaki, for those really interesting reflections. It was really fascinating to hear about how the mobilization during COVID has, to some extent continued, and that is a priority now um, of the NTP and to continue to ramp up the PPM as that continues to be a really important part of case finding and getting people to treatment and diagnosis. Um, so thank you for sharing that. We'll move on. I think we have about seven minutes for questions um, from the audience. Yeah, you can use the Q&A function um, at the bottom of your, your bar, uh, at the bar of the Zoom screen. Um, and we've gotten, I think, one or two questions already, or a couple of questions that have been answered. Um, I think one, one logistical question is, are, will the slides be available afterwards? Yes, we'll be making these available um, and providing links also to some of the resources that were referenced during the presentations. Um, but aside from that, I think we'll have a panel now with both Bola, Dr. Opioma, who's also from the NTP, and Dr. Anyaki. Um, and just to kick off, um, I have a question for you all, which is, we you talked a lot, Dr. Anyaki, about the importance of sustaining um, some of the things that were started during COVID to really ramp up case finding in response to that drip, that dip that you saw at the beginning with the the, the lockdowns that really did result in an, in an um, acceleration of notifications. And you talked about sustainability. And I'm curious, from your perspective, what are the most important things that you as the NTP or others who are working in this space can do to sustain some of those positive um, gains that you're seeing? Is it for me? That could be for you, that could be for Dr. Obioma, that could also be for Bola too, any of you. I think you need to repeat the question, Lauren. Okay. Repeat the question, please. Yeah, so the question is just what, you talked a lot about the importance of sustainability. What actions are, are you as the MTP taking to, to really ensure that sustainability of those different actions of PPM is actually happening? What, what are you doing to, to ensure that? Okay, so um, basically, like I said, if you run through the principles of primary health care, which states that for us to be able to tame any infection, the or any disease entity, the people, the community, or the get pickers must be, uh, you know, proactively engaged. Now, we have realized that we wouldn't be able to run effectively with ending tuberculosis if we do not actively engage the community structures, not just for public sector, but for even the private. They must be armed. The civil society must be part of it. And that's the only way you can take care of stigma, you can take care of discrimination. And you will be able to also talk to the community to so put in that commitment of making sure that there is domestic resources on taking for advocacy. What do we mean by the community structures? Even the philanthropies, even the business tycoon, people that are doing very well, they come from a community. So by that community structure, you are making sure that everyone is carried along. And that will also give room for accountability framework. So for us as a national program, we are moving towards giving the power to the community, activating the civil society, 
In fact, recognizing the uh, survivors of TB because they will be the one to speak up, to say, yes, I've passed through this, and this is what we can do. So if you ask me, my number one strategy is to make sure that I bring every person, especially those in the communities, activating the community structure through the, through the, um, um, the gatekeepers in the communities. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to recap a question that came in um, through the Q and A um, that Paula addressed, but but just since the Q and A is sometimes hard to see, um, the question related to um, an observation from somebody I, I think that may be um, familiar with the Indonesia study, um, but they noticed that the the delay in care seeking that we observed in the COVID study in Nigeria was quite a bit shorter than what the average delay in care seeking in Indonesia was. And there was a question about sort of what, what are the enabling factors um, that encourage patients to, to do care seeking? And Bola, you had a few a few thoughts about that. I think Dr. Naki, it, it connects to some of the importance of the community mobilization you were just talking about. But Bola, if you have any other thoughts about, or if you want to sort of recap your response yeah. in the, the chat, um, it may be helpful for the rest of the audience who didn't get to see it. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Lorraine. Um, the first thing was that um, while Nigeria was shocked like the rest of the world, you know, about, uh, you know, by the COVID-19 pandemic, the national program quickly responded by churning out a series of, um, you know, SOPs that will guide providers on how to proceed with triaging with um, you know, um, you know, testing patients or screening patients for both TB and COVID, and how to approach um, contact tracing even in the community, how to go about community activities in spite of COVID. There are a lot of guidelines that were available. So we were emboldened as partners to use these tools to educate our providers. We had webinars, online webinars, where we shared all these SOPs with them and providers put them to good use. So I would say that was a major factor in making sure our providers were ready to continue providing TV services in spite of COVID. Secondly, we had informal private sector providers, like Dr. Inke mentioned, who were in the community, the PPMVs, the drug shops, who were among the people, and they just went all out of their ways to um, go to patients' houses. They all, a lot of them also remained open, and they collected samples and linked patients to diagnosis. That was a major factor. And thirdly, our providers had been trained to be patient-centered. So they did whatever it took to make the patient get the best experience possible. Um, they, they made sure that they had infection control, um, you know, um, equipment and activities um, and facilities, and washing facilities, they maintained um, spacing and all of that to help the patient were still able to come. And then they were ready and willing to even take drugs to patients and convey um, ex workers, their own staff, and our adult staff were screeners to the facilities. So, providers were really patient centered as well. And all these three major factors, I think, contributed to ensuring that patients had a better experience in spite of COVID. And that reduced the delay and the care seeking time. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Lola. Um, we are just running up to the top of the hour, so uh, we and we only have an hour today. So I just want to ask the panelists for some final thoughts. I think probably drawing on the importance of the community mobilization and kind of sustaining that over time, and also just looking at some of the questions we're seeing in the Q and A. Um, it's a little bit on some final thoughts about what are the important factors to continuing that. Um, to continuing community mobilization around, around PPM, so continuing to engage and incentivize a public-private partnership in TB identification and notification. What are those important, what do you think the most important factors are to continue to accelerate that into the future? Um, Dr. Nyaki, you can start or, or anybody on the panel can, can jump in if, you're, if you don't have any other thoughts. Was busy responding to a chat. Please, can you come back with that question again? Let me handle it. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, um, it's, it's, oh, Dr. Obiyama, did you have a, a thought? 
Uh, okay, so um, apologies, my network hasn't been very stable, but I, I think the question I had is uh, sustainability of the incentive in the private sector. Yeah, so the, the question is more okay. final thoughts. Is on that the right most... question? Yes. Yeah, so the yes. Yeah, so the final final thoughts that you, um, Dr. Bola or Dr. Anyaki, have about what it will take to continue to um, encourage PPM in the future. What are the most important factors that that you, as the NTP, or Bola, as as somebody working outside of the NTP, but with the NTP, what are the things that you'll do to sustain that PPM in the future? As we've seen, it's so important for. Um, notification during and after COVID. Okay, so um, for us um, in the country, one of the things for us is um, um, knowing the fact that in, in the country, um, the PPM facilities cover about this. And that means that uh, they actually take, um, they still have like a broad base of patients to I'll take care of. And the fact that we have some patients who who just would go to the PPM facility, uh, basically based on that, uh, we know that the heaviest thing in the PPM is actually the uh, the resources, the incentives, and the fee for services and enablers that um, surround states. So as we much as we are working in fact, at the domestic resource mobilization in country, having the private sectors all come together, organizations to ensure that we have, the, um, we're able to also generate these resources within us in the country to be able to continue this is one aspect. And the second aspect is our push towards insurance. We are actually working towards ensuring that um, a lot of these TV uh, services are covered under the insurance policy in the country. We've done an uh, actuarial analysis in country, and based on that, we've been able to identify three models that states insurance agencies can take up. So depending on which one falls in within their own capacity, such that as they're also engaging the private facilities in um, those states for other diseases, we actually, it's, it might not be as fast, but it's in process. Then uh, we also know that that's um, engagement with the private facility owners. You know, we have a, the professional regulatory bodies and um, private um, practitioners and national program and partners, which meet every quarter. And within this, we, can kind of look into the issues that come around in the private facilities to uh, in the PPM um, intervention to also um, ensure that we are ahead in terms of uh, providing supporting and the um, and the condi conducive environment for them. So I'll leave the rest for the national coordinator and maybe Dr. Valandi. Okay, I'll just add on to what you said before the other national coordinator ran up, and uh, I'll take it on from what you said, Dr. Biyama, about health financing, about health insurance. I mean, health financing is, uh, um, is what the country should be looking at to re reduce donor dependence and also to ensure the sustainability of, um, of the healthcare services that we provide, including for TB. And building on that, um, the national program has demonstrated a lot of flexibility and adaptation and innovation in engaging the private sector and for us to maintain um, the trajectory and even improve it going forward. We need to maintain that stance of being flexible, adaptable, and innovative with private sector engagement. Thank you. So, in addition, the country the, the country runs one health system which is led by the Federal Minister of Health and also coordinated, uh, that also coordinates the policy and the guidelines. So we have the National Council of Health, 
which is the highest decision making body on health issues in the country. That National Health Council on Health is composed of the state ministers of directors of state ministers of health that is being led by the commissioners of health, and also the private sector is also part of it. So at that level, we discuss on how to go for the ownership and sustainability of the health system in the country. And that runs through a policy. Now, the country is running towards establishing a robot safety net. You can call it the health insurance scheme to ensure that every Nigeria seeks help, whether at the national health insurance scheme or the state health insurance scheme, or even at the community level. So at that point, it is opened for every cadre of human beings, both the cyclists, the, the barbers, or even the market women. That's a, that's a contribution that they must make to make sure that whoever that falls sick is taken to the healthcare facility. That is going to be a kind of, you know, um, you get from the, 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 the rich ones and now they take care of the, the ones that, that are even at the lowest end. So that is what the country is, because we are aware that, you know, the external funding cannot run forever. So we are making sure that we do put all these things together. And that is why we feel, we feel very comfortable running to the communities, activating the community structures, because they have to own it. Everything is not money. At the community level, they will be able to appoint those who will be able to help in certain areas, even sample logging and sample transfer and everything, making sure that people take their drugs on time. And that is where we are also activating the civil society and uh, survivors of tuberculosis, because they will be the ones to drive it. The communities. So I, I must also say that it is not all that about money, but commitment and passion, and be able to set up, you know, um, accountability framework. And it will not be able, we won't be able to run that if we do not get people at the community level who can speak, who can ask for questions. Civil society can also ask questions. Of course, we need the 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 the, the buy-in of every person from the private sector who can, you know, deliberately make some commitments and we'll come up with poor resources that will be able to take every person out of any health situation in the country. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for those really nice reflections. Um, I'll just note that in the, within the question and answer panel, there's a, there's one open question um, that Dr. Anyati is already, um, are already addressing. And um, we are so happy to have everybody join us and thank you. So I'm gonna pass it over to Ajay now that we are at time, um, but thanks again for your reflections. All right, um, thanks everyone for such a lively and interesting discussion. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Bolanle. Thank you, Dr. Anyeke. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Obioma. Thank you, Charity. Thank you, Lauren. It's been, I found it particularly interesting. I think there's a lot to learn. There's so many lessons learned and it's great to see that Nigeria has been able to actually apply the lessons learned and is using it to take the program forward. And I feel like there's a lot to learn even outside of Nigeria. Other programs can look at what it is that has happened. And I feel like there's just so much reflection here that this webinar alone is not enough to really um, delve into that. But the lively discussions have definitely helped and we want to take that forward. So for all those questions that have been asked that we haven't necessarily resolved completely, we're taking them on board and we're going to um, address them in future webinars. Um, um, speaking of future webinars, our next webinar will be on the 3rd of May and we'll be covering universal health coverage and TB in collaboration with FHI 360. So that really fits in very nicely with a lot of the talk about sustainability um, and about insurance and so on and so forth. So we'll definitely be talking more about that uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, we'll also be launching a poll um, 
to share, please share your feedback on what you thought about the webinar, uh, how you think we can improve, so on and so forth. I, I, I want to, um, we still have most people, I mean, we're over time already, 11 minutes, but most people are still here. So I hope that um, that already is um, informally telling us that people have, have found it useful and it has been interesting and you've learned a thing or two, but we'd like to hear the details. So please fill the poll, it's in the chat. So please, if you can you just give us some feedback, that would be really great. So thank you all so much for joining. Thank you for every person who put up our chats, anyone who just basically listened, anyone who joined. Um, we're really happy to serve and we hope that um, you, we will have more engagement in the future. So that's basically it. Thanks everyone.